Good morning, everybody. It's time for the next um, chapter in By the Great Horn Spoon. Today we're gonna hear the pig hunt and there's good luck in his cage. And so we're gonna find out what happens on this pig hunt. It's not a very long chapter again, so. <clears throat> Jack began to dread Sunday dinners. It was bound to be good luck's turn on the menu soon. The pig no longer came trotting after him. It was true, for Jack had tied him up in a pen to make it escape-proof. But the porker remained on his mind, if not on his heels. And then, with Rio de Janeiro only a few days away, Jack saw the cook leave the galley with a heavy meat cleaver in his hand. Good grief, thought Jack. He's going for good luck now. Without a second thought, Jack went sliding down the nearest ladder. When the cook arrived at the animal pens, the porker was gone, and so was Jack. It's that boy, shouted the cook, waving his meat cleaver. Pigs for eaten, not for pets. Soon, even the gold seekers joined in the pig hunt, for the promise of fresh pork made their mouths water. They looked above decks and below decks. They glanced up masts and down ventilators. The cook himself went searching through the cargo hold where Monsieur Gaunt, a Frenchman in his rough homespun of a farmer, was watering his precious grape cuttings. Have you seen a pig down here? growled the cook. No, no, said the Frenchman, but rats, oi. The chase continued and the pig hunters looked everywhere, but the captain's stateroom, which was fortunate for Jack and good luck, were hiding behind the open door. Not a sound out of you, Jack said to the pig. The pig snorted out of sheer love for him, rubbed his ever fattening side against Jack's leg. Shh, said Jack. Just then the captain himself could be heard approaching along the passageway. And when he entered his cabin, there was no sign of the boy or the pig. He hung up his blue cap and yawned and took a nap. When he was sound asleep, Jack and good luck crept out from under his bunk where there was hardly room to even breathe. Jack looked around wondering what to do next. It seemed hopeless, but he wasn't going to deliver up the porker to the cook without a battle. Leaning his bristled back against Jack's leg, the pig grunted a loud word of endearment and almost woke up the captain. Jack's breath caught. Any port in the storm, he told himself, and he ran. He made a beeline towards his own cabin with good luck trotting behind him. At that moment, Mountain Jim happened along the passageway and the pig went through his bowed legs. As many gold seekers had joined in the hunt, others considered it sport to outwit the cook. Mountain Jim merely turned to give Jack a little wink and he went on his way down the hallway. Once in his cabin, Jack stopped short. Dr. Buckby was stretched out for a nap and snoring very loudly. Moving on to his toes, Jack approached his hammock. He would wrap good luck in a blanket and hide him in the hammock. And when Jack turned, his breath caught again. The porker had his two front hoofs on Dr. Buckby's bunk and had leaned his head very closely in to see what all that snoring was about. <clears throat> the horse doctor awoke and he found himself staring into a strange grunting face. Thinking he was about to be set upon by map robbers, he was, he was more asleep than awake and he be began to blow his horn on his neck. Jack was horrified. The trumpeting sound like a sick elephant, it would bring the entire ship to that room. It's only us, Dr. Buckby, Jack cried out, but he couldn't be heard over the blare of the horn. There was no way out of that cabin but the door, and it was too late for that. Quickly, Jack got his arms around good luck, climbed on the sea chest, and tried to stuff that porker right through that brass porthole. But good luck got stuck half in, half out. But Jack put his shoulder to the job, and it was no use. You're done for now, Jack yelled at him. Praiseworthy, hearing the alarm trumpet, was the first one back in the cabin. What's this? he said, sizing up the situation quickly. A pig in a porthole? Have you seen the cook? asked Jack desperately. He was still pushing against the pig's fat rump. A few paces behind, said Praiseworthy, opening his black umbrella. Step aside, Master Jack. When the cook entered, together with several gold seekers, there was no pig to be seen. Praiseworthy had taken up position directly in front of the porthole with his umbrella blocking the view. By then, Dr. Buckby had stopped trumpeting. Robbers! Robbers! he cried, trying to get my map. I almost caught one of them, a big fellow with fat cheeks. A mere dream, said Praiseworthy. The cook raised his meat cleaver again. There's the boy. Where's my pig, he said. Pig, said Praiseworthy. What pig? He's got it. I know he does, said the cook. 
and praiseworthy turned to Jack. Pig? Pig? Master Jack, do you have a pig? Do you turn your pockets inside out, boy? Our chef seems to think that you have a pig in your pocket. The gold seekers began to laugh at that. <clears throat> There's no robber in here or pig either. Come on, boys, let's go. But the cook turned at the door, squinting at praiseworthy. It's none of my business, he said, crossing his big fat arms. But do you ever stand under that umbrella indoors? This cabin leaks shamefully, said Praiseworthy. I need my umbrella. But it ain't even raining, said the cook. One can never be too careful in these latitudes, said the butler. Now good day to you, sir. The cook left, shaking his head, and Praiseworthy folded his umbrella. And when Jack glanced back at the porthole, his eyebrows jumped an inch. The pig had vanished. Look, Jack gasped. He's, he's, he's gone. I declare, said Praiseworthy in genuine surprise. Jack stuck his head through the porthole and looked around. There wasn't a soul in sight or a pig either. Jack left the cabin and ran out onto the deck where he found Matt, Mountain Jim, Jim seated on an overturned barrel and playing Oh Susanna on his harmonica. Have you seen a big black pig, sir? Asked Jack out of his breath. Seen him? said Mountain Jim, Jim grinning. Why, boy, I am sitting on that pig. And he tapped the side of the barrel with his harmonica. Jack wiped the sweat off of his forehead and began to smile. Thank you, Mountain Jim, sir. The porker was safe, at least for the time being. I thought I'd need to use bear grease to get him out of that porthole. Now sit down, Jack boy, and we'll do a bit of singing to pass the time. I've learned you can trap a grizzly and a boy your age needs education to how to do that. Jack seated himself beside the mountain man on top of the barrel, and soon he was singing to the windy accompaniment of the harmonica, drowning out the snorts and the grunts from the pig underneath the barrel. <clears throat> <clears throat> they sang, Oh, Susanna, well, don't you cry for me. I'm coming to California with a washboard on my knee. When the cook paused, <clears throat> when the cook passed, sorry, Mountain Jim lifted his yellow bobcat hat and one big hand and went on playing his harmonica with the other. After dinner time and well after dark, Jack returned with the pig. Here's a picture. <clears throat> a few feet away stood a small stern boat with a canvas thrown over it. He waited until the after deck was clear of passengers. Then he lifted that barrel, gave the porker a hug and shoved him under the gunwale of the boat. Done, he said, straightening out the canvas. He supposed that his cat and mouse game of cook and pig was doomed, but he wasn't giving up yet. Good night, good luck, he said to the pig. The pig replied with a little snort of true love and began scratching his back against the underside of the boat seat. Sunday passed without pork roast for dinner, and the following night the Lady Wilma anchored off the green coast of Brazil. With the coming of dawn and the side wheeler entering the channel and passing under the fortress guns of Rio de Janeiro, Praiseworthy and Jack stood on the deck with a warm breeze snapping at their trousers. It seemed to Jack that he had almost forgotten what land had looked like. The mere sight of a hill or a distant tree excited him. And then the sunny harbor came into view with church bells ringing out across the water and houses reflecting on the dazzling morning sun. Homesick, Master Jack? asked Praiseworthy. <clears throat> Jack looked up. I wish Aunt Arabella and Constance and Sarah were here with us instead of at home. But of course, the gold country is no place for women or children. It's not too late to change your mind, Master Jack. We can go home. Change my mind, said Jack. The butler rubbed the tip of his sharp nose and looked down into Jack's eyes. Cape Horn lies ahead of us. It's a very bad stretch of water. Very bad indeed. And the captain tells me, the wind comes howling like a banshee and the waves can batter the ship to splinters. No one will think less of you, Master Jack, if you want to leave the Lady Wilma here in Rio. We'll manage to get passage back into Boston. <clears throat> Jack turned away from Praiseworthy's gaze and tightened his eyes against the breeze. He felt a welling up inside of him. Didn't Praiseworthy want him along with him any longer? I'm not scared, he finally whispered. The thought hadn't crossed my mind, said Praiseworthy. You said we were partners, said Jack. We are indeed, but I could never forgive myself if... Do you think that we're going to get smashed to smithereens, said Jack? The Lady Wilma's a stout ship. Do you think Captain Swain is a good master of it, said Jack? None better, answered Praiseworthy. Jack looked back up into the butler's eyes. Go home? 
how could he go home without his pockets full of gold nuggets? Then I'm going to California, the boy said. I am not turning back. No, sir. He wiped his nose and he wiped his nose. If you don't want me along for a partner anymore, I'll try. And he stopped. Don't talk nonsense, interrupted Praiseworthy, with a sudden smile as bright as the morning. You said exactly what I want you to say, but I had to be sure that you were ready. You'll do, Master Jack. You'll do. He put a hand on the boy's shoulder and Jack looked up. He could feel the reassuring grip of Praiseworthy's fingers and the butler winked and Jack smiled. Wiped his nose again and above them in the pilot house, Captain Swain was looking for the sea raven among all the ships that were at anchor. Their masts were thick in re as reeds in a pond, and many were gold ships like the Lady Wilma herself, pausing to take on some fresh water and fresh supplies. When the customs boat came along the, cap came along the boat, Captain Swain shouted down, Is the Sea Raven in port, sir? No, Captain. She left us five days ago. The ship's master was telling him something he did not want to hear. Blast, said Captain Swain. Well, we won't tarry by grabs. We'll sail tomorrow with the outgoing tide. While the Lady Wilma took on coal and fresh provisions, the gold seekers invaded the city. There were Americans everywhere. Jack posted his letter to Aunt Arabella. If he had found his sea legs, he had lost his land legs. He caught the cobbled streets of Rio seemed to pitch and roll right underneath him. Praiseworthy had to use his umbrella as a cane until the city stopped heaving about. Throughout the day, the ships could be seen arriving and departing. Old friends from New Bedford or Salem or Concord met on the streets, and thousands of miles from home, they knew each other. That night, when Praiseworthy and Jack returned to their ship, their arms were loaded with exotic fruits never seen at home in Boston, like bananas and pineapples and guavas. And when they woke up the next morning, the Lady Wilma was already setting to sea with a course of outgoing tide. Jack stood in his cabin and looked out the porthole and watched the city slip away, holding up its windows like mirrors to the pink dawn sky. After breakfast, Jack started for the stern of the boat with table scraps for Goodluck, who was still under the boat. Suddenly, he heard a blare of Dr. Buckby's trumpet alarm again, and a moment later, the horse doctor appeared from the passageway under the trumpet at his lips, and his cheeks were swelled out like apples in red. The noise brought passengers from every direction. It's stolen! It's stolen! yelled Dr. Buckby as he was wailing and pausing for breath. It's gone! What is gone? said Praiseworthy, interrupting the stroll around the deck. What's gone from you? My gold map! It's ruined! The horse doctor gave a final wail on his trumpet. My brother, rest his bones, posted it to me as he lay dying in California. And now it's gone. Stolen. Gone, he said. Cut Eye Higgins, said Mountain Jim. But almost at once, it was discovered that Cut Eye Higgins was gone too. He had been forgotten in the haste of coaling and watering the ship. And when Jack reached the after deck, he found that Good Luck was gone too. Even the small stern boat was no longer there. All that remained was the canvas shaped over two empty boxes like a keg. The scoundrel, said Captain Swain. He must have lit out in the night as we lay off Rio, waiting to enter the channel, rode himself ashore. Turn back, turn back, yelled Dr. Buckby, waving his tin trumpet in the air and going in a circle on his peg leg. Impossible, said the ship's master. Then I am ruined, sir, ruined. Nonsense, said Praiseworthy. I dare say there's more than one gold mine in California. You may be the first man among us to even strike it rich. Jack said nothing about the pig in the darkness and the hurry of his escape. Cut Eye Higgins must have not realized that he had a curly-tailed companion aboard that boat. Jack was sorry about Dr. Buckby and his treasure map, but he was pleased with good luck's good luck. The thief had no doubt beached the pig with the boat, and Jack watched the green coast of Brazil slip away further and even smiled to himself. The porker was going to be safe from the cook. <laughs> that is the end of chapter four. So, again, more adventures at the sea and their first sight of land, and they're getting ready to go through the Cape Horn, which is a really good part of the story and quite eventful. So, hope you enjoyed that part. I'll see you all soon. Bye.